Good afternoon. Welcome back to the Extraordinary Technology Conference 2017. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce to you uh, a fourth year speaker here at our conference, Danelle Roberts. Danelle has uh, came onto the scene a couple years back um, speaking about noble gas engines and just blew everybody away with that. His knowledge of particle based, um, plasma based physics is just profound. He's written a book called Particle Mechanics. So, without further ado, I give you Danelle Roberts. Thanks, Vern. Hey, uh, you guys have done a great job on the video, by the way. Uh, outstanding. Thanks very much. Um, uh, for many years, I went through, studied physics, studied things, and there's a lot of things that didn't make sense. The uh, probably, I'm going to say, my biggest breakthrough in physics when I was reading through one day, when it goes, nobody's seen the inside of an atom, and they probably will, but scientists believe this. And I'm like, okay, so all that chemistry and all that physics that I was taught was a guess. No wonder it didn't make sense to me. All right, so what I did was I can visualize things in my head, all right, and see them. So I started visualizing uh, my own little world, and I base everything on the fact that everything's made of particles, and each particle has a state and a shape, a size, a speed, and a purpose. And then when it strikes something else, it will change its state, have a different size, and it will have a different property and different things that it does. So I wrote a book called Particle Mechanics, The Theory of Energy States. And I tried to take my ideas and put them into illustration. And a guy named Henry, Henry Thomas helped me do that. Um, and that's available. Now, today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about my ideas on visible light. And then I'm going to go back into what we've done with the Rohner effect and with Bob Rohner. And we're up well over 300% over what we were last year. Got some really good footage. Everything's at 120 frames a second. So I'm going to do my visible light, and you're going to see how these particles tie in together and cause the phenomenon that we see and don't understand. Now, what I believe one particle in, one particle out. Like I said, the particle may be the same state or different sh state. Now, it could have changed directions. It could have been reflected. Um, several things can happen. Now, I'm going to start with a solar panel. I think everybody knows how a solar panel works. Light shines on the solar panel, and it changes it into electricity. I don't, I don't think anybody has any problem with that. All right, so what I think is for each particle that comes in, I know there's a conversion thing, but the particles that come out, there'll be a little cord that comes out the back. That one particle that was light changes into an electricity particle. So now if you can imagine three solar panels, one, two, three. And each solar panel collects light and sends an electronic signal. Now, we have visible light, the stuff that makes us be able to see. So I think God said, let there be light, and there was light, and there was a purpose for it. That or nothing exploded and became everything. If I ever figure out how to make nothing explode, I'm going to do it, and I'm, I'm going to create about a ton of gold and put it on my porch. All right? So that's, that's where you are. So there was something made that causes light, and there was a reason for light. Now, this is what I think. Light is three particles. Red, that's one state of it. A second state is green, and a third state is blue. So why do I think that? Well, I, I design computer software for a living, and when I first started working, I noticed the computer screens and the TVs just have three colors they emit. The red particle, it comes from a red gun, we just called them guns back then, uh, and a green particle comes from a green gun, and a blue particle comes from a blue gun. So when you write a computer program, you can send it a number 0 to 255, 255, and then you send three sets of them, a red number, all right, a green number, and a blue number. All right, so if you want it all red, you would send 255 comma zero zero and you would get red. All right, if you wanted yellow, you could send 
uh, 255 for red, 255 for green, and you would see yellow. If you wanted white, you'd send 255, 255, 255, and then you would get a white light. So now I'm like, now wait a minute. We were taught that white was a, or light was a wavelength. All right, well, the computer screen isn't a wavelength generator. You don't generate wavelengths. All right, and just think about it. Your TV is that way, and you, uh, TVs look so real now that you, you can't hardly tell the difference between them and, and then the real world, and that's all they're emitting. And so I'm like, can all those people that 150 years ago that said, or 100 years ago that said light was a wavelength, could they be wrong? Is it possible? Well, now, on the other thing, your eyes have three cones. A red cone, a green cone, and a blue cone. And then there's another, another cone. But think of these cones in your, eye, in your eyes as a red solar panel with a cable behind it, a green solar panel with a cable behind it, and a blue solar panel in your eye. And so when you shine a particle, all right, if it's a red particle, the red particle will become an electricity signal and it'll go to your brain. All right, same with the green, same with the blue. Your brain then tells you which colors there are. Now, in my book, this is a page out of my book, what I did is I took the particles and I gave them shapes. For example, this is a red particle, this is a blue particle, and this is a green particle. And each of them have a different shape. Now, if you take these and you were to put them in a bow and arrow and shoot them, all right, they're going to go and they're going to hit an object. So if an object is flat, they may bounce off, all right? This one may bounce a little bit to the side. This one may bounce off to the left or to the right. The red particle may hit and stop dead or may come back. So if you shot your particles and they were hit something in a ball shape, they're going to bounce differently if you hit something that's concave shape. So what you have to think about is you have particles moving everywhere and they have different shapes and they're going to go different ways and they're going to do different things. Now, a particle can also change directions. So one of the things is, is when you send it through a prism, what you do is the green particle goes through, and if you look at how it does, they all reflect a little bit to the right. The red particle reflects a little bit to the left. And the blue particle splits, doesn't go down the middle, goes a lot to the right and a lot to the left. And then if you just take those colors and you blend them, you will have your rainbow. Those three colors will build your rainbow almost like clockwork. Now, visible light has different colors. So now what you have to imagine is there's electricity coming from the camera, and it's not showing what you see on black. It's not showing any light. So you see black. So now the video camera is sending all the colors red, green, and blue, they hit the white screen, it reflects all of them evenly, and so you see all the colors. Your three solar panels all get a red, a green, and a blue, and your brain tells you it's white. Now if it's red, you're shining the light on, okay, and it strikes the screen, and there's only red color going to the screen, so there's only red color coming back, and your red cone or your red solar panel sends that signal to your brain. So if you have to think about it is, electricity particle, uh, or a, a light particle, goes to the screen, the light particle bounces off, and then it changes into another state, which is electricity, and that's what you have to think is, the same particle goes from place to place. Now green, same thing, the green color, bouncing off the screen. Blue color, bouncing off the screen, going to your balloon cone. Yellow is red and green, and when it strikes the screen, both bounce off, and they go to their red and green cone. Now, why is somebody colorblind? One of their red or green solar panels don't work right. 
And that's how I see visible light. Very simple. It was made for a reason. And that reason was so we can see. Now, if you think about how many particles are moving, everybody in this whole, depending on where you are, those light particles that bounce off there, they're all bouncing to everybody and everybody sees it with great detail. There are lots of them. So whenever somebody talks about ether or the other things, just, just think about how many light particles that are going by me to get to your eyes, or by to your eyes. All those particles are going everywhere. Now, this is going to tie into this here in a little bit. On these particles in, particles out. Now, the Rohner effect I defined last year, a guy named Bob Rohner, he built the mechanical engine that ran for PAP. Um, and PAP put the gases in, finished the electronics. All right? Now, as you all know, Joseph Papp died with the secret. Bob was trying to figure it out, and he invented something else that's different. It does a similar thing, and I had seen some of the work that he was doing, um, and basically he had a three-inch piston that would fire and not produce any heat. All right, so I called him up. I'm from Missouri, the show me state. Well, you're going to have to show me, because I don't believe it, Okay. So I go up there, and, and this was one of the devices here that he had. This is the, right there is the three-inch cylinder. So I drove up to Iowa. He fired that thing up, and it was lifting, I don't know, 50, 100 pounds. I don't remember at the time. And it was pretty impressive. It was lifting an inch or two. And I go, all right, take it apart. And he took the whole thing apart. I go, now, put it back together. So he put it back together. And... One of the things he has, he uses, we, or we use noble gases, and there's these little inserts on the end here where we charge up, and he will vacuum out the tube, and then he puts in, uh, he's got a little thing, and then you fill it uh, with noble gases. And when I talk about noble gases, they sometimes call them inert gases. We use those. They, they're not supposed to react with anything else, all right? But anyway, we, we put these noble gases, and he buys a, uh, a tube of this, or we do, and it's like... Um, two or three thousand dollars because it's really pure stuff and there's a certain percentage of helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon that's in this and that would cause this to fire and there was no heat. Never would see any heat in this forever. And then through the years now, that was about five years ago, uh, he invited me to come here and I got to sit up here with him and we've, we've worked well together. Um, Bob is a, as far as I'm concerned, a mechanical genius an electrical genius, and this is a shop. He was raised in a shop. Over here he has a lathe, and back here he has a mill. So if we need something, he just makes it, which is really nice, and that's how we're op able to operate on the budget that we have. All right, but last year we were showing this. This is a four-inch piston. That was a three-inch piston. Four-inch piston, all right. This is a five-inch piston. We've tested with it some. Um, we may be using some more. This is the rotary engine that I invented. So I came up with my idea, a rotary engine. We had one with a bunch of blades on it, and we put all the power we could put to it, and we got it up to 1,800 RPMs in three or four seconds. All right, but this is a, a, like a fourth generation. This was a fifth generation where we left off uh, last year, which we were going to test. And I'll give you those test results here in a little bit. Now, that's the... That's the uh, as you can see, it's two inches across here, two inches across here. There, that's the little piston or the rotor. And then this little valve right here opens and closes. Then when we seal this up, we always have to seal everything because you suck it out, vacuum it out, and you put in the noble gases. You can get contaminants. It'll still work. But when you do, it, stuff, you get white stuff on the inside, and it's just you, you got to clean everything out. All right. Now, none of this is sealed. All right, this is just closed tolerances on the sides and this. So we get blow-by in this. When I talk about blow-by, when you fire it, air is going to go by it. So now, last year I defined what is the Rohner effect. The Rohner effect begins with an electrical charge being introduced into a mixture of gases, which is what I said was what we do. All right, the gases will have a simultaneous primary expansion and a secondary expansion followed by a primary collapse and a secondary collapse. We've done real well on this. 
we got those two phenomena to separate and they're showing a directional flow and a collective behavior. And we're going to show that in a little bit. Now, but here's what's really strange. The gases exhibit characteristics of a liquid while in the primary and secondary expansion states. So it's real hard to measure liquid pressure versus gas pressure. Now, the gases exhibit no significant change of temperature. There is no heat in this. It never has. I have never seen a gas heat up. Now, some of the electrical equipment may, but none of the gases. Now, we were up there testing on air one time, and we had something we called a plasma blaster, and I, we were firing it, and he goes, are the electrodes or anything getting hot in there? How's it look? And he was just saying that. He wondered how it looked. Well, I've been over, and I looked, and I didn't know it, but he fired it, okay? And it went straight into my eyes, all right, unprotected. There was no heat, and there was no damage. But since then, I wear sunglasses. I wear protective sunglasses because I'm stupid sometimes. I'll get so concentrated on something, I don't realize what was going to happen. But I'm an eyewitness, okay, that there is no heat. Now, Bob likes me to have ideas, and I have lots and lots of failures. And this idea here was, I thought, one of my dumbest ideas. Let's put a balloon over it and see what it does. This here is the device that Bob uses to cause the expansion of gases. Now, um, this is a wobble. It's just a real heavy-duty balloon. It's a kid's balloon is what it is. And so we fired this up, and it has, it has produced wonders of knowledge for us. Now, one of the things I want you to look at, this is one inch right here. This is the results of last year. So I'm going to show you the results of last year to where we are this year. So when you fire this, you always see a brilliant flash of white light. So electricity's going in, light's coming out. Now the next thing is, camera, everything you're going to see is 120 frames a second. All right, this is with a GoPro. It's not a real expensive camera, but it, it shows a lot of stuff. So when we get to here on this third frame or fourth frame here, you notice we've went about three inches. The balloon has expanded out to about three inches. All right, that's where we were last year. And notice how it kind of looks like a liquid as it kind of goes around here. Now, the other thing is, this was our four inch piston. This was 150 pounds of weight. This, with the, with the piston combined, and so whenever we fire that same explosion in that balloon, as we go here, you see it, there's one inch, two inches, about two and a half inches. And that was 150 pounds. And we were really happy with that last year. We had mega data discovery, and we were up 40%. We've got a device, I'll just tell you, we just hook it up, we don't put any more electricity in, and we were getting a 40% improvement. Well, we've enhanced that, and it keeps paying dividends. So now as you watch it, it will fall. But that's where we were last year with the four inch. Now, that collapse, we're gonna cover a lot, because it has changed. Notice how that stopped 150 pounds. Now, this was the rotary engine, it's from the opposite angle, firing against the piston there. Now it fires. Now, if you saw there was a little black mark, let me back up. See the black mark there? So it takes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve to get to there. That's where we were last year. That's one revolution with one hit. And then it continues on around. As you watch the black mark there, it will continue on around for two and a half revolutions. That's where we were last year. But I want to concentrate. It took it took twelve. It took 12 to get one revolution last year. Remember, there's no seals around that, and there is some of the metal touching. Now, when we set this up, this was a twin. And we just decided we would fire in from the side. Pressure's pressure, right? Guys, when we fired in there, and this thing cost a lot of money to make, and we spent a lot of time on it. When we fired, it only went about an inch and a half. Or, I mean, like a quarter of an inch. And we thought, well, what's wrong? 
And so as we went on, we have found that these gases have a directional flow and a collective behavior. Now, this is the same wobble. This here is about six inches. So when we fire, watch what happens. We were only able to go three inches last year. With the upgrades we have made, this now is going over a foot. Now, also notice something else. This is right here is round. This right here, notice how it followed straight up from here. That is the directional flow in the collective behavior. It's kind of like it's sticking together and going up. Now, this here appears to be the primary expansion. This is the secondary expansion. Now watch how fast, like I said, this is three times, at least three times what we were last year. Now watch how the secondary expansion has collapsed and went away. I mean, it's, it's only three or four frames in and it's gone. So that collapse goes quick and goes away quick. Now this one here, as you watch it, notice how it kind of shows liquid qualities. Let's go to frame 15 here. Now as you see frame 15, notice the size of it. It's probably about five or six inches and about four inches across. So at frame 15 here, it is about 40, uh, I'm going to say about 60 cubic inches. If you try and measure it, it's going to be in that ballpark. So now if we go on here, notice how slow it goes away. Notice it goes from probably about 60 cubic inches down to about 40. It just slowly sinks. I'm only going to 50 because if you follow it, it'll, take, it'll go all the way down to about 120 before it goes all the way down. It slowly collapses. Now, here's the rotary. This is the sweet spot. Okay, we have fired. Notice the black. Notice the valve is closed. So, we have fired. Now the expansion. It goes so fast that you can hardly see how far it's moved. You can see the black spot here. The valve is already that pushed it is already moving open. So so watch. We do that. That was one, two, three, four. So we're one revolution in four one twentieths of a second. It's pretty remarkable because we had to do all our power to get that first rotary up going to get to get the, and, and what that is if you divide four into 120 frames a second. That's 30 frames a second. We went from zero to 1,800 RPMs with one hit. So, yes, we're very happy about this. Now, as you watch, that's one revolution. You can start to see it better. That's two revolutions. That's three revolutions. That's four revolutions. So we got four and a quarter revolutions out of that with one hit. So can we make it run 1,800 RPMs? Yeah. Can we fire that fast? Right now, no, we're not there to make it fire that fast. Now, this is our four inch piston. Now, here's where we put the gases in. Um, four inches up here. Now up here, we didn't put weights on it anymore. There is a reason you don't put 400 pounds of weights up there. All right, and I am going to get to show you why we don't do that. There's a little number here that says 8.3. This is a three and a quarter cylinder in here. This here is 40 pounds on it. So, with a, so what you do is you just multiply the 40 pounds, so the total weight of the pressure on it is 332 pounds, significantly more than last year. Then when you add in the weight of the cylinder, and the metal shaft that we have in there, Bob makes this stuff heavy duty so it lasts, and this one's been lasting for a long time. So we're talking about 380 pounds that we're lifting. So now when you watch this, as we go, this here, there's a little ring here. I'm showing you that's how far we can go is four inches. So now, 
four-inch piston is firing. The rubber ring is up here at the top. So when we fire, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, so we, this year we are lifting 380 pounds, four inches. All right, and at a pretty fast clip. Now, one, now, we go to frame 15. Now, we're on frame 15. Remember on the balloon, frame 15? The balloon was almost the same displacement. Shouldn't be possible. All right, because we're holding 400 pounds. The balloon was not holding 400 pounds. Now, watch as we go along here. Not only did we, we pegged it, and it held it for two-tenths of a second, which is way more than we had last year. Now, when this thing fires, it goes wham! And I mean, you hear it peg out, and you hear it, it strains everything. Now, Bob and I are kind of like myth busters. Yeah, let's throw another couple sticks of dynamite in here and see how it goes. Well, on this one, we didn't want to put any more pressure on it than what we were because it slammed so hard. Now, in the past, if you fired just a, with a with much lower level of output that we were getting, if you fired uh, the cylinder with no pressure on it, four inches, you, you weren't even going to get four inches. It would go down and it would stop and it would come back. All right? Hadn't been able to quite figure that out till now. All right? But anyway, we only made this four inches. We weren't expecting to exceed that. So we're up at least 300% on this, maybe four. Now as you go along, you will watch it slowly comes down. Now there I'm measuring it, and what happens is, is that, that, that rubber ring was at the top, and then as it pushes it up, it sticks and it just comes back down. That's why you can measure it each time. That was four inches with that much power. Now, this is an experiment here that we've tried. The tube does not have any, anything at the top. So watch, watch this as we go. We fire. Piston's right there. Seven and eight, it peaks. Now watch what happens. It sucked it all the way back down. So where is the pressure that held? We're at frame 15. All right? Just a little bit ago, we were holding almost 400 pounds, 4 inches. Where did it go? What's that? O over the RPM now. Here's the one thing is, we're at frame 15. Now, how fast can we fire? Bob's holding it open. Oh, by the way, this is Bob, all right? This, this is Bob Rohner. This is the guy that we owe, we're gonna, I think we're going to owe a huge debt to. I don't think if, he, if Pap hadn't run into him, I don't think he'd ever heard of Joseph Pap. all right? Um, this guy is a tireless researcher. He's 74 years old, okay? And I, I work with him well. I mean, like I said, he's a mechanical genius and he's an electrical genius. All right, but now at frame 16 right here, we're able to fire again. All right, so this is about eight frames, or we're going to be able to fire eight, time, eight times a second, which is going to be around um, 500 RPMs. But on this right here, it's a perfect cycle. Did you see it? The cycle up and the cycle down. And now as we fire up again, there's some things that we didn't do too well on. Right here, we didn't have our tubes real good. All right, so it separates right here. Now, because of the airflow that now sucks in, it continues on up the tube. Now, right there, air, and that's why the piston went higher, as you see it up there. Now, now this is why we don't put 300 pounds on top or four. What goes up must come down. Now, here we go. 
So not only is Bob smart, he's pretty fast. <laughs> now, if we had put 400 pounds up on top, do you think we could? It's going to crush stuff. And that, that's why we have changed stuff um, to do this. So now we're going to have to go, what's going on? What is going on? So I'm going to back all the way up here. And we're going to look at the pounds per square inch. That's why I didn't put 120 frames of these on here, guys, because it slowly goes down for 120. Oh, and the reason those gears are on top, we didn't bolt that down. And if you don't bolt that down, it's out of balance, and the thing just shakes and goes everywhere. So, All right, now, once we start here, to, to blow up a balloon, if you blow one of these up, you can blow it up with your mouth. We're probably talking what? One or two pounds per square inch? So as we go here, fires, expands out. So at this point right here, we're probably talking one pound per square inch or two to do that. But the balloon holds it in and keeps it in. So it does keep the gases under pressure. Not a lot of pressure, just a little pressure. So we're going through, it slowly shrinks, but it's slow. Now, on the rotary, when we fire, one pound of pressure is not going to move that 90 degrees. So what is it? How much pressure is it? It's going to take a lot of pressure to do that, especially considering you have blow-by. So as you watch it again here, it accelerates and at frame 15, like we were showing before, frame 15 or 16, we already got two and a half revolutions. Now in the rotary, the collapse does not matter, doesn't affect it. Now in the four inch piston, when we fire it, now with a four inch piston, you got 12 square inch on the piston or about. So to hold this here, you would probably, I'm going to guess, the 400 pounds, I think it's, it would be, what, 30, 32, 34 PSI. That's if it was regular pressure. Now, that's why I'm saying this kind of looks like liquid pressure. If you go back and you look at the balloon, if it was filled with a liquid, that's what it would do. All right? And if the liquid slowly dissipates, like the balloon, it would slowly go away. So if we fill this with a liquid, too it's going to show the exact same behavior. That make sense? Now as we go on here, you see it holds it. So it looks like the gases are changing into a liquid, expanding into a liquid, all right, and then slowly converting back to a gas with lower pressure. Now that is until you get here. So when you get here, you fire here. Now, this is a three inch piston, and I, I don't know if it weighs a pound or two, it isn't very heavy. All right. This displacement here to here is probably about two feet. So, what we did was we have expanded here beyond the 50 or 60 cubic inches. So, what we've done is the gas has expanded beyond that that we had before. Now, once it is fully expanded, you get a full, and I mean complete, total collapse. 
So why is that? Well, I'm going to go back, and I think I actually have the answer to this. So I'm going to back all the way up here and show it again here. And we're going to deal with the particles and what they're probably doing. Aren't you glad I didn't put 120 frames in, in these? So, remember guys, we have went through thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of frames to get this, this footage. But we get to compare four things side by side to help us reveal the secrets of this thing. Now, the directional flow and the collective behavior. So whenever we fire, electricity goes in there. So right here when we fire, imagine this. The electricity particles come in, and what comes out? Light's the first thing that comes out. Now, what else is the electricity doing? Before, I thought we were expanding the atoms. All right? Now I don't think that anymore. I think it's real simple what's going on. All right? Some of the particles come out as light. The other particles are going in and forming a circle. And there are two sizes of the circles. If you ever want to figure out particles, get you one of these. These are some times and you can get them at several hardware stores. So if you just imagine that the electricity particles have went in and they have formed a set of small bubbles and a set of big bubbles, the primary expansion and the secondary expansion. So what happens is in a gas, if you have atoms and they're bouncing around, and a liquid is, the atoms are touching and they're rolling around. So what I think is going on is we are filling up the empty space with bubbles. And the bubbles are in between everything. Now you have the big bubble and you have the little bubble. And the little bubble appears to be a little stronger. Now, the collective behavior. Why does it stick together? Well, if you think of it this way, when the bubbles formed, they may have hooked some of the other bubbles between each other and between the atoms. So if you want to see how it's sticking together, some of the bubbles are stuck together. Some of them aren't. Now, then the next question is, if there's bubbles in there, when and why do they pop? Because they're going to have to form, and they're going to have to pop. So if you look here, like what we did here, the secondary bubbles, the primary bubbles between the atoms are right here. The secondary bubbles have went up here, and they've kind of stuck together. Well, once they fully expand or whatever else, they pop. They're gone. Boom. Happens quick. Like right there, it goes away. Now, these bubbles, the little bubbles, they take a long time to pop unless they're under pressure. So, if you think of it this way, you have your atoms in there that were bouncing around, all right, as a gas. You fill bubbles in between them. There is no heat. There is just bubbles. So whenever somebody was trying to tie thermodynamics to this, it wasn't. There's no heat. So the bubbles expand in between. And I think Moray, I don't know if Moray's here, Moray's been preaching uh, nanobubbles. Um, so we're seeing, maybe seeing that here. Now as you go through, and you just look at it, the bubbles pop under pressure slowly. So you show them all the way out to about, you know, almost a half a second here. But it acts like a liquid. Why does it act like a liquid? 
because the atoms are touching the bubbles. Now, on the rotary engine, you're going to fire it. It's going to go 0 to 1,800 RPMs. It doesn't care about the collapse. But if you back up and you look right here, whenever it fires, 32 pounds of pressure, if that's what it was, is a liquid. All right, the liquid is going to have trouble going around through, through the spaces we got. Like I said, it's not sealed. That's what would make that do. And plus, it will plug up the empty holes, these bubbles. They fill in, launch it. Four and a half revolutions. Here's our single piston again. Goes up. All right, now the bubbles don't care if you've got 400 pounds on them. They're just going to slowly pop and slowly go away. All right, and so as they slowly go away, it just slowly goes down. And you slowly um, see a decrease. Four inches. Now, what's different here? When we fire, we have took all the pressure. There is no pressure. We have actually went past. So I think the bubbles, once they are free, all right, of any pressure, they pop. All right, think of a bubble. Have you ever had a, a bubble that you, that's, that's stuck to a table? and you could stick your finger in it and touch it, and whenever you pull it away, the bubble would pop. So what I think here that we have done is, by letting this expand and go out, all the bubbles pop and go away. And then as you watch it, I mean, it, it goes down faster and then it goes up. Then it'll go up again, and then we see the tube fall over. Now, has anybody got any idea why this is so hard to figure out? It's what? No, no, we're, we're not having, there's, it, it flows in and out quite easily. Um, yeah, it's going to push it. All I know is I, I can't move it uh, whenever you put the pressure on it. I mean, just a little bit far as to push the cylinder. So you're just saying the small tube doesn't push it down as fast? He thinks what? Oh, okay. That's just on the top piston that's pushing it down. There is a separate piston up there that pushes it down with 300 and, well, 332 pounds. I mean, you, you can't move. As soon as you put a little bit of pressure on that, it's very hard to move the piston. Well, on this, um, I, if we fire the four-inch piston before, I mean, in just a tube that would go down, it would suck it back. Um, we're talking that this other cylinder is, is on the top. Now, that was before we had this, the, the new things and the new upgrades, plus Bob's made several improvements uh, to do that. So now, um, where we're going to go here is... All right, the collective uh, directional flow and the collective behavior. So where are we going with this now? Um, need a drink of water. If we go back to the four inch piston,
just to show Chuck here. See, this cylinder up here, Chuck, is a separate cylinder, and it's pushing down onto that cylinder with, with that pounds per square inch, with the 40. But now, if you look at how this operates, on this piston, when you see it fire, we went four inches. So you got 12 square inches on the piston, and it has went up four inches. So you've got 48 cubic inches. So now, if that's not enough to let it go um, all the way up, okay, to let the gases collapse, on the other piston that was the three inches, the three inch piston has about seven um, cubic or square inches. So if it goes like two feet, we're talking it needs to expand to maybe 80, 90, or even a cube, uh, not cubic feet, cubic inches. We need this to expand several more inches. All right? And what will happen when we let this go several more inches? Um, all right, well, where I was going with this, but, but also, Chuck, it, it was done in, in, set, in, in the same amount of time. Well, all right, I'm going to go on here with what I had. Um, all right. When we're pegged all the way out here, see the other one did a complete cycle with no pressure on it. So if it goes all the way up and all the way down, I think if we take this and let it go to six or more inches, what's it going to do? What do you think, David? Right. So what, what's, what's going to happen is if we take this and we let it expand further, all right, then it will turn to a complete vacuum. So instead of just the whatever the lift pressure here was, we're also going to get a suck to pull it back down, like we did on the other one. So if you're wondering where we are going with this, this we're probably going to make, and like I said, we couldn't even get it to go four inches, so we were a little short-sighted and short realizing that you know, we may get here and it'll go beyond four inches. So if we take this, we will be doing experiments to see how far we will let it expand to how much we're going to let it collapse, all right? And if we get on this, that perfect cycle that we saw on the other one, see, that's, that's not a perfect cycle. It took it, a perfect cycle is... If we go up, like... There we go. We go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's that's about your perfect cycle. All right, we're pushing against a lot of pressure. So to get a perfect cycle, if you put a crank on the piston, you need the cycle to work perfectly around. Yep, yeah, but I'm, there's no crank on it. Now, on on one hand is. If you were to fire it with a crank with a four inch piston on it, like we're right here, what's going to happen to your crank when it gets to the bottom? It's going to stick because it's still got all this pressure on it. So if we get the perfect cycle on the four inch, I'm going to go on through here. Right there it is. Watch it here. So 
fires one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If you're on a crank, all right, now you'd be at the bottom. Now you would get a suck to take it back down, seven up, seven down, and then it fires again. So that, that's going to be your 500 RPMs. Now if that hadn't busted apart, we would have probably got another perfect cycle. But now one of the things everybody's been talking about, or a lot of people talk about, is an oscillation. All right? So if you get the perfect up, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, now you're also going to get power. If you had a crank, you'd also get power on the way down. Now vacuum is what, 13 pounds or whatever it is? You'll get a suck back down, so you'll get a double power stroke out of this. Now the one thing that's hard to measure is whenever it fires, if that's liquid pressure or gas pressure, and how much that will push. We don't know yet till we get it. But we've got to get it on the perfect cycle, and that's what we're working towards. Now, of course, here we're going to go to the end here. Like I said, Bob's still fast the second time through. Bob's 74 years old, by the way. Now, one of the things is, Thad, you were talking about thermodynamics, all right? This does not fit thermodynamics, all right? There's no heat in it. <clears throat> so one of the problems you have is you try and apply laws of thermodynamics, they don't work because that's not what that is. So I think this should be more like something called like since if these bubbles are displacing stuff, it's more like displacement dynamics than thermodynamics. Um, so um, the full expansion allows for a fast collapse. That's what we're working on right now. And there's my website, got my book. Um, so we're continuing to research on this. So I guess we're open for questions. Thank you, Danelle Roberts. And by the way, these are real results, okay? And I'm, I showed the success and I showed the failure, all right? This is not some pie in the sky, where are you going to go? If we get what I think is a four inch piston, all right, with a six inch stroke, and we can run that at 500 RPMs, I think it's going to give us a really nice little engine. And I don't, I'm not able to calculate the horsepower of that. But I think we're able to produce that right now. That's assuming the collapse will happen in the six inches. If you go back to, if you go back to frame five, I think, on the open cylinder test, okay. the, the clear tube, I think it's around frame five on there that you see the vacuum start to form where it actually lifts the entire assembly up into the air. Right? All right, I was wrong. It was around 10. All right, let's start at 1. Okay, so one, 1. Fires. You get your fire. You're going up, but right around, okay, right around 10 then, you start to see a right little weight. I don't know how heavy that whole tube is. I'm assuming it's at least 10 pounds. It's a, it's a glass. It's a, it's a plexiglass tube. Okay, so yeah, 10, 12. It has some weight. It's more than the 2-pound piston you have in there, though, right? It's, it's what now? That piston's only like two pounds, right? Yeah, it's about that. I think it might be three. It weighs less than in the entire assembly, but right here at frame 10, the vacuum you're building up or negative pressure you're building up is already lifting all 12 pounds of that against the free falling or against the inertia of the two okay. pounds. So right there, you're already getting a collapse, but then you're saying beyond that collapse, since it keeps traveling, you're finishing expelling or sucking out all the energy from that expansion which gives you your collapse, and then you're slamming down at the same speed. Right. The vacuum, then, is what everybody, a lot of people have been talking about, getting the power out of the oscillation. All Whether right. it's and vacuum so, or hydraulic right. reduction. Yes. So, so hydraulic it, up, vacuum down. Well, it, I mean, it still could be hydraulic down, provided you don't have a resistance on top. In the, in the other demonstration you had, it, was that... I came in kind of late. Was that 300 pounds of air pressure? Yes, basically? it was 40 pounds of air pressure 
time it was a three and a quarter cylinder piston okay so it was 8.3 square inches so that's how we were measuring the 332 okay plus the weight of the piston so on that you're saying that since it's slowing it down it didn't have time to expel all of its energy so it was still in an excited state whether that's like a liquid plasma form of whatever gases you're using so with this open cylinder test couldn't you keep trying different diameters or different weights of pistons to see if there's any any correlation or formulation between where your expansion is where your negative pressure begins yes we're and then you can time that, an engine that, you're, that's where we're going okay that's awesome i yes. love your work good job thank you are there any more questions for Danelle roberts anybody want to see another frame or anything else or where we're at which ones This one here? All right. Look at the separation. There you see it as it starts to collapse and it starts to suck it. Is that what you want to see, Dan? All right. What would you call this? Is this displacement dynamics or thermodynamics? <laughs> okay, all right. I'm all for that. So, uh, guys, I like sharing my ideas. Um, like when we come here, um, my daughter came with me two years ago, and I got two sons, Eli and Caleb, and uh, uh, one of my other daughters asked Jessica, how's it going? It says, well, it's like when we take um, Eli and Caleb to the park and we turn him loose with these friends. Okay, that's what dad's like. <laughs> so I'm here with my friends, playing with my friends, so I really enjoy this. So um, this is something to think about. This is real. This is just one form of plasma. There are, there are hundreds. All right, thank you very much, Danelle Roberts. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a break. We're going to be back.